hello to everyone that has joined today. Uh, on behalf of Team Shimanli, I welcome you all to be a part of this session that talks about university admissions, uh, things that you wish to know as an educator that can contribute to your child's development towards this field. I'm Ruchira Banka, uh, and I'm grateful to Shimanli to provide us with such platform to, to uh, you know, as teachers to collaborate and learn from each other. In the endeavor to spread the importance of developing life-ready skills, Shimili runs live interactive sessions for students from grades 1 to 12 and also provides professional development opportunities for teachers to support their learners. We as educators are all doing our bit to provide quality education to students that helps them become responsible citizens of this, I believe till date, a livable planet. And as lifelong learners, it becomes our foremost responsibility to keep ourselves updated on how do we show them the path that they dream of. And university choices is one such. Choosing a university is not a day, is a month's affair. We all need to empower them with skills from early childhood for them to be able to take the right decisions. And today we look forward to know more about it from our guest speaker for the day, Mr. Jim Crawley. Thanks, Jim, for sparing time from your occupied schedule. Great. Thanks, Richard. It's good to be here. I'm glad. Uh, a bit about Jim. He is the Director of Global Recruitment at Hope College in Holland, Michigan. He's worked at public service universities and private colleges throughout Michigan for over 25 years. He travels for recruitment throughout Latin and South America and Southeast Asia. Mr. Crawley presents dozens of virtual sessions for students each year, and he presents sessions and workshops regularly at national and international conferences. And trust me, these were the only two days yesterday and today that he was available to have a session with all of us. And we're glad to have you here with us. We look forward to this session. Over to you, Jim. Great. Thank you so much. It is a pleasure to be with you. Um, Richeru was right. I just returned from South America on the weekend and I leave tomorrow night for Asia. So um, I'm glad that we could fit this in um, while I'm back in the U.S. This is a, um, a very interesting topic because it's near and dear to my heart. I've been recruiting for... Um, over 25 years internationally, and this process can be can be challenging for parents, for counselors, for teachers. And so, what I want to do today is really go through all the components of of the U.S. university application process. I don't have all the answers. I wish I did. I would make more money if I really had all the answers. But you know, I have a lot of information to share, and I want to um, open the door to you as well to ask questions um, at the end. But if you do have something that's urgent in the middle, um, please, you know, kind of let me know. Um, I will be happy to try to answer that. But we definitely have time at the end, without question, um, that we can we can field those things. So let's go on. And uh, we'll move on to the first screen. So what I want to do today is we'll give just a few bits of basic terminology that things you might hear, and, and I'll try to define those things for you. We'll also look at, you know, what are we as U.S. universities and colleges looking for, um, how students are, you know, choosing to where to apply and uh, making that difficult choice, um, and then what are the components of the application? And when, when looking at those components, how do we make the admissions decision? And finally, what's next for the students? So they've been admitted um, or even not admitted. We can look that direction too. But if they've been admitted, like what is next for them? So let's take a look at some basic terminology. So first of all, who is an international student in the U.S.? So that's a fairly simple question, but it could be a different answer depending on what school you're talking to. But generally speaking, an international student for purposes of immigration is anybody that's not a US citizen or green card holder or refugee. Um, anybody on a visa status or who will be on a visa status would be deemed an international student by most every university or college in the US. The category of when, I, when we have a U.S. citizen, some of you may have a U.S. citizen in your schools, potentially. Um, very often they are, um, like in my case at Hope College, I will work with them as the international recruiter, but they are a U.S. citizen when they enter the country. So um, they can file the FAFSA form, the federal financial aid form, whereas an international student can't. So that one's a little bit of a gray area when it's a U.S. citizen as to how the school will treat them in terms of admission. But when it comes to financial aid, they're a U.S. citizen for purposes of aid, and they enter on their U.S. passport. If they're if they have a U.S. passport, they have to enter on it. Um, 
And, and with that international student too, all of you probably know, but I'll just repeat that they would be entering typically on an F1 student visa. That's F as in Frank, F1 student visa. There are other visa categories, but that's the, the general one for um, those coming to pursue a degree. So the second point can be a little confusing um, to some uh, students and families, and even sometimes to counselors. We have schools in the U.S. that are labeled junior colleges or community colleges. We also have schools like Hope College that have that word college in their name. We also have schools like Michigan State University, which again, have the university in the name. So what is the difference in the pros and cons amongst those choices? Well, the junior or community college is a two-year institution. Um, and those students will go and pay typically less tuition to go to a junior or community college. And then if they will end up, if they stay there for the full two years, they could complete a, a, an associate's degree, a two-year associate's degree. Many of them will then continue on to a college or university to complete the third and fourth year to finish their bachelor's degrees. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that um, a little bit later, but uh, uh, that's the two-year program. And then the college versus university, it's important to note that in the U.S., we use those terms interchangeably. In other words, when I ask a, a, a student here in high school what they're going to be doing, I say, where are you going to college? I don't say, where are you going to university? Um, whereas internationally, more people would say, where are you going to university? But that's where it's interchangeable. We view those as the same. Um, and schools like Hope College, we offer only four-year degrees. So most colleges, not all, but most colleges only offer the first four years of the bachelor's degree. Whereas universities most traditionally will offer not only the bachelor's, but a master's and possibly PhD uh, doctorate degrees as well. Some would say that it's better to go to the college where you want to, or go to the university where you want to go on to master's degrees, do the bachelor's there and then just move on to the master's. I don't know, that isn't always the case. It just depends on the school, where the, whether that's advantageous to be in the same school and move on um, up through the degrees. Um, I just know that at our school, we have kids getting into the best, some of the best graduate programs in the nation. So I know it, it doesn't always work that way. But I would say sometimes for professional schools like um, Creighton University in Omaha, Nebraska, Creighton has some professional level schools like med schools and dental schools. And so they do say, if you're in our undergraduate program, you have a better chance of getting into our med school. So I think there are some cases where that could be the case where it's better to be there for bachelors, but there are so many four-year colleges in the US that, you know, that feed into these graduate programs at universities that I think it's only a rare case when it's an advantage to go to the same school and continue on. So again, interchangeable, they mean the same thing. They both offer four-year bachelor's degrees just university offers further degrees. So let's look at a couple of, of, of the other terminologies, the, the early action, early decision, rolling or regular admission and define those. So early action is a non-binding um, uh, program. So for example, we have early action. You apply by November one, and then you get a decision in the first round of decisions that comes out. And that's the first week of December. So early action just means apply by a certain date, get your decision in the in the first round of decisions by a specific date. There's typically, um, there may or may not be any scholarship advantage to that, but normally not. Um, it's really the advantage of the school because then they can get an idea of how many students are really serious and are, are applying early. But other than that, it's non-binding. You can apply to as many schools, student can apply to as many schools as they want early action. Early decision, however, is different. Early decision is a binding program. So if you're going to apply, if a student's going to apply to early decision, they are saying, if I get into this school, I am going there. If they give me an offer, I'm going there. So if you do get an, a, a, an offer from early decision, the student is required to withdraw all other applications. It is a binding program. I don't encourage a student to do early decision unless they absolutely know that they will go there if they get that positive decision, um, because that's just how the program works. You have to withdraw all other, all other applications. So that can be either a, a relief because now you know where you're gonna go, or it can be rather stressful because you could say, well, I don't know if that's really where I wanna go. It's so early in the process. 
The other factor is the financial. You really need to know if you're going to accept that that decision that you are going to be able to go to that school, that you can afford it. So that can be a little challenging, especially so early in the year. Rolling a regular admission just means that as the application is complete, we get you a decision. So many schools will move to rolling a regular admission after the early action or early decision period is over. And they just move to a rolling admission. So really quickly on the test testing, which will be the ACT or the SAT, test optional schools, which to Hope College is a test optional school. It just means that you can send it or you don't have to say, it doesn't matter whether you send it or not. If you send it though, we do consider it. If you don't send it, there's no penalty for that. So it's a, totally up to the student. If they have a good score, I would send it. If they don't have a good score, I would not send it. Um, test blind, it means it, even if you send it, the school will not look at it. Um, so they're completely test blind. And then test required, uh, we'll go into that a little bit later, but there's schools that still are test, uh, test required for the SAT. Um, really quickly, this one, open admission, selective versus highly selective. There's a whole screen on this that I'll go through, but basically um, open admission is not much in the way of requirements. Selective has some re requirements, some minimums, and highly selective would be like the Ivy League. Um, and again, we'll go to a screen about this. Need aware and need blind, that again is related to whether a student has the finances to attend the school or not. Um, need aware being we consider that ability to pay in our admissions decision. We don't in particular, hope, hope doesn't, we're need blind, but a school would consider the ability to pay in the, in the admissions decision. Whereas need blind means your income doesn't have anything to do with the admission itself. Um, so let's go into these screens in particular and talk a little bit more. So as these students are thinking about the factors of where they wanna go, my advice is that they definitely do the research and they, they bring that list down. Some schools have, some students have lists of 10, 20, 30 schools. That can get pretty expensive if everybody has application fees. We don't happen to have an application fee, but many schools do. So I recommend between one and three first choice schools, like these are the dream schools, this is where they wanna go, but it is also be important to be realistic about those dream schools. One to three schools as well that the students would be very happy with that. Okay, if I don't get into my first one of my first three or this group would be fine. And then one to three safe schools. So the student is applying to between three and nine schools. I think nine is probably a lot, but um, that's up to the student. Um, you just have to go through all that process with that many schools. So. The safe schools are really ones that admission, there's no guarantees, right? But that you're fairly sure the student is going to get into these schools. So when you're working with a student, I think it's very important to consider their concerns, their interests, and the requirements of the school um, as, you're, as you're going through this. Do the student's qualifications actually meet the institutional profile? That's where that realistic view comes into play. Like, is this something that, um, or a place where that student could really go, is it a good match for the student? We're not in the business, most of us, of uh, just filling seats in our in our residence hall or in our classrooms. We really want students that want to be at our schools and that can be successful in our schools. That's where the admissions um, kind of scrutiny comes into play. We want to make sure that they can be successful. And then finally, can the student afford the remaining cost after scholarship. Sorry, we cut off that sentence right there, but can the student afford the remaining cost after scholarship? That's what that's a big key thing too. You don't want the student to go through all this whole process only to realize, oh, but I can't afford it. Um, that's important to have that dialogue with the family and also with the school as to what might be available. So let's look at some primary considerations that we have from our perspective in this admissions process. And I will um, go through each of these individually too. But the data from the application obviously is very important. We have academic transcripts. We have test scores, English proficiency. Some will require resume, some will not. But typically on the application itself, you will find a lot of those places to list most of those activities. So many times there's no need to include an extra resume, but again, that's up to the individual college or university as to whether they want to request require that. 
personal statements and essays, they're, they're, again, there are usually spots within the, um, the institutional application, if you use that, there's spots to fill in some, some short essays. If, you, if a student uses the common application, then there usually is a separate essay required. Um, and the school could even require additional essays. So it's up to the individual school. Some don't even have an essay requirement. Um, I think the less selective the school is, the less of these items they actually require. Then there's such things as recommendation letters. Um, again, that's going to be uh, one that is not always required. I'm gonna to be totally honest with you. I've never got a negative recommendation letter. They all kind of, kind of said the same thing. Um, so I think it's important when we look at that screen in a minute to talk through what, what a recommendation letter should have to make it really stand out and look different. Portfolio and auditions, that's related to fine and performing arts. So typically you won't have any of that, obviously, if the student is not going into the fine or performing arts, but we'll look at that as well. And finally, financial support. So let's look at some of these particular screens. First of all, the application for admission. So what are the options when a student is, is thinking about the actual application? Usually the two most common ones are the institutional application, which is within the website of the university. The second most common is probably the common application, which students can use to send to multiple institutions at the same time. There may be other options, but there's other companies out there that are also doing kind of applications that go to multiple schools. But I'm just listing probably the two most common ones. It's really important that the student fills out the application completely. As I state here, when there's a blank in the application, we don't always know if, like I say, if the student didn't have that information, to, they didn't know what to put there, they didn't have an answer, or if they're really omitting something that we should know about. So I think it's important that students put, you know, an NA for not applicable or put some answer in there so that we know that they have read the whole application, they just haven't skipped some parts. I think it's kind of important for us to know that and understand, you know, what information that we're looking at, or in some cases, what information we're not looking at. When you're thinking about the free form sections of an application, like if there's an essay section or uh, where you're putting in um, really any information for that matter, make sure that the spelling is checked. You don't have the option of using spell check when you're within an application. So it's important that you're being very careful that you're spelling things correctly because it does reflect upon the student if we see that it's, it, it, that it's very sloppy or it's not done well. Um, we question the sincerity of the student. We question the student's interest in our university if they really aren't taking the time to, to be careful with the application to fill it out completely and to spell correctly and that kind of thing. It's obviously, this last point is should be very obvious, but unfortunately, we do get a lot of fraudulent information, um, not from any one country, just kind of from across the board. Um, be honest and truthful with information. Um, a good example, this isn't so much an honesty thing, but, but students will put like um, a ton of information in the application that is maybe not needed in some cases or maybe exaggerated in some cases. And the thing is, anything in your application is fair game for us to ask you about. Like, if you put it in there, we can ask you about it. So if you put, if a student has put in there information that maybe isn't quite true or they've exaggerated, if we start talking about that and the student doesn't know what we're talking about or can't answer the questions, again, we will kind of question the sincerity of the student. So if, if the student even gets to that point where there's any kind of an interview or phone conversation, sometimes there isn't even a conversation, so it doesn't come up. But it's important that this application is filled out completely and, um, and that all the information is, is very complete and honest and open and you know that we're able to talk to them about it. So the academic transcripts are something that is going to come, should come directly from the high school. In some cases, that's not possible. In some cases, the student has the copy. It is up to, the, up to the college or university in the US whether they're willing to accept a stamped copy from the student. Typically, we do like to receive that official document from the secondary school, from the, uh, from the college counselor or another administrator who can scan it to us directly to the student's um, file. So the transcript needs to show, or the mark sheet, uh, as the case may be, needs to show all classes completed 
as well as grades and marks received for each class. So, and, and if, if possible, show us the class, the classes that student is currently enrolled, enrolled in as well. So the student will be applying many times during their final year or before their final um, testing is available. And that's fine. That's the same thing as in the US. Our students apply during the beginning of their final year of high school. So we only have the grades up through grade 11 or whatever the, in your country, whatever the second to last year would be before they finish. So we, we don't have that final year because that's when they're applying. So we are um, making an admissions decision based on the grades that we do have in our hand. The only way that I feel that a student could have an, a problem maybe is if they totally like really do a bad job in their final year, uh, because we will ask for that final transcript um, in the in, prior to in full enrollment. And if the student either didn't graduate or really failed the last year, there is totally a possibility the school could rescind their offer of admission. Probably doesn't happen very often at all, but that possibility is there. If the student is graduated, then that should already be indicated on the document. Or if there's nothing on the, the mark sheet or the transcript that says um, student has you know, graduated, then we need a copy of the graduation certificate just showing the student has finished. Again, we will ask for that final transcript from currently enrolled students prior to them actually starting classes with us because it should be available sometime before they actually start the university classes. Um, and if a student has taken any university classes, it is important to note that we would need an official transcript from the university as well. And that would be the case if a student, you know, were to go to graduate school, the same thing. Um, we would need that official transcript from the university if they were going to graduate school in the U.S. So transfers or graduate students have that university transcript requirement. So how do test requirements work? So I talked about that just briefly when we looked at the agenda. Since the pandemic, U.S. schools have remained test optional. Not all, but many of them have. Highly competitive college universities, however, may still require the official test score report. Um, the reason really for that is uh, when you're in a highly competitive situation, every bit of information is, is used as part of that decision. And so they have really felt that the SAT or ACT is, is a necessary part of that process really almost to weed students out like they're they're trying to narrow it down to really a small number of students who actually will attend the university um but most of us have remained test optional when you're looking for those schools that either require it or even if you're curious about kind of who gets admitted to a u.s school most of us will list that mid 50 percent range of sat scores on our website um, they, we don't usually list the minimum requirement because that's not uh, usually a set in stone minimum. Like we're looking at the grade point average and the test score and other factors to make that decision. So it, there really usually isn't an exact minimum or if the school does have one, they're not going to publish it. Um, so it's more often that you get that mid 50%. This is the mid 50% of students that normally get admitted. So if you're in that range, you're kind of meeting our requirements. Um, if you're below that range, maybe or maybe not. It depends on the other criteria as well. It is important to note that some some institutions do accept a super score. Um, this means considering the best of the sections if the score is taken multiple times. So the best verbal, the best math section, putting them to, together to create a super score. Um, you can certainly ask an institution if you have taken, if the student has taken the SAT multiple times, certainly worth a question to the institution to know if they accept super scores or if they only accept the most recent score or they only accept the highest total score on one test. That will kind of tell the student which, which tests they are gonna send the school, if they're gonna send them at all, or if they wanna send them all so they can create their super score. So the other test uh, is related to English proficiency. A lot of schools will have this requirement many times regardless of the language of instruction of the school if the international student is in a country where english is not the the main language now there definitely are exceptions but these are some of the main um score uh tests that could be accepted um the otofl iel test and duolingo and i actually threw in the cambridge test as well that might be a or the logo for that that might be another one that is 
very often uh, accepted. I would say the most common in the U.S. is TOEFL. Um, the second most common is IELTS, and and the one that's come up recently in you know the past few years that's becoming very popular is Duolingo. Duolingo is the least expensive of the three, and all three of them are offered online now. So a student doesn't have to find a testing center; they just have to they can take it online. Um, as I say at the bottom, it they could be waived if the English if the, is the student's first language and if the language of instruction in the school is totally in English. Um, it just depends on the policy of the school. Um, some schools might even accept a strong SAT or ACT as meeting the English section of that as meeting the requirement. You have to find out from the school what they're willing to accept. Um, if a student is in an IB school, International Baccalaureate School, quite often that meets the requirement. However, I have been in many International Baccalaureate schools that are, that are bilingual schools. They're not totally in English. So in that case, even though it's a bilingual school, we would likely still require the TOEFL unless they have a certain grade in IB English, then that will usually meet the requirement. So again, there's exceptions to the rule. Sometimes there's hard and fast rules. It really just depends on the school itself. And remember, as I mentioned earlier, and many of you have joined since my introduction, Please write down your questions. We'll have time at the end. I'll make sure that I stop in time or I'll be done in time for questions um, about anything that we've talked about. Um, I'm happy to try to answer the questions for you at the end. So resume or activity profile is another aspect of the application file. And so um, we've got a number of things that students will put on the resume. Um, as I mentioned, many students remain test optional. And some still require that test score of the mid 50%. I think something got mixed up in my screen here, but that's okay. I'll go through these um, and I'll come back to the resume and activity profile. Um, that may have been my error, sorry. So we talked about the super score. Let's go back though, actually to the, I wanna talk, even though the, the text is wrong. And again, my error on the resume activity profile, let me speak to that. Um, the resume and activity profile, so a resume is not always required, as I kind of mentioned earlier, because many of the activities are listed on the application. So the only time I would recommend that a student, unless it's required by the school, the only time I'd recommend adding another resume is if you're adding something that we're not already seeing in the act, within the application, because we ask for all of the activities and leadership and volunteer work right in the application. So if it's not there, or if you need to explain them some things or give detail, then certainly a resume or activity profile can be added, but just keep remember, remember, sorry, remember that the activities for the most part are included in the application. So make sure that we're not adding a bunch of documents just to add them. We don't need to see all the little certificates that a student achieved. Um, it's just extra paper in the file, so to speak. Um, uh, we just we need to have the information, but we don't necessarily have you listed on the application and then to also provide copies of every every certificate that would kind of it's kind of redundant. We do want to hear about it, but we don't need to see all the documents. So let's look at the personal profile, this personal statement and essay. Um, make sure that when you're if there's an essay required or if there's questions within the application, make sure that the student is following the directions. That's the key thing because there, there's usually some kind of a prompt, some kind of a question or a statement that the student should be addressing within the essay. So make sure they're reading that, make sure they're answering that question. I'll give you a very good example of that. We have a full tuition scholarship competition. So students can certainly, they can apply for admission. If they're admitted, they can also apply to this full tuition competition. And this could really apply to any college university that has a scholarship competition. Sometimes, and with us, there is an, an essay. That's the first round of, of where our decision is being made is on that essay, whether people move forward to an interview. Well, the important thing is, if they don't answer that question, the specific question that is asked, and they don't keep within the word limit, they're eliminated right after I review that essay. So, you know, that's, it's pretty, but we feel if they can't read directions, they don't deserve a full tuition scholarship. I mean, it's pretty much that simple. It's very competitive. 
So it's important that they're reading the prompt. And this could this could come into play too with very selective colleges. Highly selective colleges will have specific essay requirements, maybe more than one. And again, if the student doesn't address the prompt that's being asked, that could be the difference between being considered or not being considered. Um, use spell check and have a teacher review it or have somebody review it, another uh, an adult review it that has really good you know, English skills. Um, and then just to make sure that you're hitting everything um, the way you want to and that there's no errors in there, grammatical or spelling. If, if the essay is being addressed to a specific institution, which is a good idea, make sure you've used the correct name for the institution at the top. Every year I get essays addressed to another school, every, every year. Um, again, that's probably not in my case enough to cause a student to be denied admission, but it does give me some pause. It does give me um, the question of how serious is the student if they, you know, how many schools are they applying to? And are we really one that they've researched and know about, or are we just one of 30 schools that they've applied to and they didn't pay any attention to the essay? It is the student's opportunity to give us information about themselves that may not be already in the app application. Um, don't repeat everything that's in the, the uh, uh, from the application. Tell us other information, address the question, be creative, be original. And that, say, that should say, um, don't use chat GPT. Don't use the chat GPT to create your essay because we can, we can kind of tell, I mean, it's difficult, but you can tell when an essay looks too perfect. Um, I will actually go out, if an essay looks too perfect, I will go out and, and check it against the fraud websites to make sure that they haven't pulled it from somewhere else. Um, and if it clears it, great. Uh, that's a fantastic essay. But if I find that they've, that they've copied an essay from somewhere else, then that's going to cause them a problem in the admissions process or could cause them a problem. So recommendation letters, um, they're not always required. It's important to look at the, like we don't require them at all. It's important to look at the requirements for each school. No need to send the documents if they're not needed. It just adds more documents for us to go through. If it doesn't add anything to the file, it's just more we're having to look at, but it's not adding, it's not, it's not moving the file. It's likely though that at least one of the schools a student applies to will require one or more recommendation letters. So it's good to ask for students to request these you know, about a month, at least a month ahead of time, maybe your school has a, a different time, a time frame of how, how much ahead you want them to apply. But just remind the students, do not ask teachers at the last minute to do these. They don't appreciate that. It takes them a while. And also, I don't think the recommendation will be as good um, or as well written if they're required to do it in a rush. Um, give them some time um, and make sure you tell your students to give their teachers some time to get these letters together. Um, and that the student should ask the teacher what information would be helpful. Some, excuse me, some teachers know the students very well. Others, because of the size of the school, don't necessarily know them as well. They might know them just in class and, and that's okay. But again, I think we want those teachers to talk about the student as a person and their, not only their success in that school, but their potential for success in our university. Um, that's what went here. We don't, we don't want them to just reiterate everything that has been listed in the application. That's not really helpful because we already knew all of that. Recommendation letters are almost always required for highly competitive schools. And my last point is they can be very helpful for students, possibly, that are considered borderline in terms of admissibility. So if they're barely admissible, or if there's a question about their admissibility based on their grade point average, a recommendation letter from the counselor, from a school, from a teacher, those kind of things that might help the student to be able to get in. It just depends on the situation. I don't want to say that's always the case because there's really never any guarantees because each school is going to treat each, each situation differently. I would say the, the smaller the school, like, you know, Hope College, we're 3,200 students. Um, and I review all of the international applications and all of those that are U.S. students that are living abroad. I, I, I review all of those and literally read every page of every application. So um, I can take more time. I can really look at the situation. It doesn't mean I'm that I'm going to admit students that, that I don't think are going to be successful. I'm still selective in who I admit, but I try to consider every factor when I'm making that decision. So let's just briefly on audition portfolio. This is a very limited or select group of students who who need these, 
But an audition typically is going to be required for a departmental admission or scholarship for the music, theater, and dance programs, um, or a portfolio for art. And if the, if the school does have creative writing, then they might have a, a sample or a portfolio required for that as well. The really specific schools, fine and performing arts, um, both those are the independent schools, like the schools of art or schools of music or, or music academies, as well as those music colleges within a university, both could be highly selective in terms of admission. So a student will, in those cases, they're applying directly to the program to try to get in and they will be highly selective. There's only so many spots. So it is possible that a student might not get in, even if they're very talented. Um, it can be very, it can be difficult to get in directly into a fine and performing arts school. But there's schools like mine, like Hope College, who have um, fully accredited programs in music, theater, dance, and art. In fact, we were one of the first private colleges to be fully accredited in all of them. And so we have fantastic opportunities. But again, if a student wants to go directly to a fine or performing arts school, great. Um, as long as they have the talent to get in, um, that's super. That's what they want to do. That's what they should pursue that option as well. Mm -hmm. um, at schools like mine, we very often they're going to double major because I think students are realistic um, or they should be realistic about whether how much they're going to make or will they make it in the field? Will they make it in music, theater, dance or art immediately out of college? Will they make a lot of money? Um, many realize that, you know, that could be a challenge. So I need a backup career that I can make the money at while I'm still trying to make it big in dance, music, or theater, or art. So business is one that a lot of them combine it with, but you can combine majors with just about anything, probably. Um, watch deadlines. Normally, fine arts uh, for admission or scholarship within the fine arts, normally those are not flexible deadlines. So the final item, the verification of, internet, uh, of, of sufficient um, financial support, it is actually an immigration requirement, not our requirement, but it becomes our requirement because it's required to get the immigration form. So normally we have, just like we do at Hope College, an affidavit of financial support that needs to be completed. It would then need to be submitted with a bank statement from that same sponsor showing at least one year's worth of support. The amount is normally the balance after scholarship or aid has been awarded. It's important to note that even though the family only needs to show one year, at least one year's worth of support. The assumption by us and by the U.S. Immigration Service is that amount will be available every year of the four years. So it's not, even though it doesn't have to be shown in the bank, it's, I think it's also good to show more than just a year's worth because the, the U.S. consulate during the visa interview may say, great, you have one year's worth of support. What are you going to do for year two, three, and four? That doesn't mean you have to have four years worth of support in the bank, but I think what the consulate is saying, you have barely enough to pay for one year. How are you gonna pay for the future? So having more than one year's worth of support, I think is a better idea when you're trying to apply for the visa. So in cases like what we do at Hope College and many other colleges in the US, you can get an admissions decision, a student can get an admissions decision uh, before the financial paperwork has been submitted, but we can't issue the final paperwork with the visa paperwork until that financial verification and bank statement have been received. And then many of us will also verify that statement with the bank to prove that it's, it is an authentic statement and it's accurate. Unfortunately, we do get a lot of fraudulent bank statements. Um, not so much from your region of the world, where all you're coming from, and like the Indians, we don't get a lot of fraud from there. Um, but there are regions of the world where we do. So it's important that the school has a responsibility to feel that this they're comfortable with the statement they're receiving. And in fact, the student then needs to take an updated version of that statement when they go for their visa interview. And the counselor officer has to make a decision whether they feel what they're being presented is authentic as well when, they, when the student applies for their student visa. So what are students looking for in an applicant? It's simple, it depends. Um, there are over 4,700 of us. Um, we're all different. We're all looking for quantitative and qualitative parts of the application. Um, typically, we all have some kind of a benchmark or minimum level when we're trying to make that decision. So what if a school offers open enrollment? That is more like a community college. There's many of them across the US. They tend to serve the local community, but some of them do actually get some out of state or international students. They have a low or no, like a minimum GPA. It's usually very easy, more open to get in. Anybody can typically get in. These are two-year schools. 
Um, but there are also some four-year institutions that are that are kind of open enrollment or that you don't need a minimum to get in. Um, and I think you need to judge the quality of the institution. Like if they're open enrollment and it's a four-year school, um, you know, is it uh, the same quality as other institutions? You have to kind of make that judgment call. The two-year schools are typically lower tuition, but there's little or no financial aid available. And residence halls are usually not available at community college. That's not always the case. We have a couple of schools in Michigan, a couple of community colleges that do have residence halls, um, but it's the majority of them don't. So you're finding your own housing in the community if you're going to community college. So what does selective admission means? Most of the U.S. students uh, or U.S. institutions are selective in some way or another, especially private colleges. We typically have some kind of a minimum that we're looking for, but it's not the super high minimum that the next group of colleges that we'll talk about has. It's kind of a more reasonable, usually between like an A, B average. If you're on an A, B, C, D scale, it would be like an A, B average. Um, again, you'd have to translate that from your grading system, but um, selective admission is usually a certain GPA that they are looking for and test score occasionally. Um, also, the minimum for scholarship tends to be a little bit higher um, at when you get the more selective you are, the level for everything goes up. So the level for admission, the minimums, and also the minimums for scholarship tends to go up a little bit. Um, and there's normally a deadline for applications. Some select schools will go to a wait list, like they will reach a point where they're full and they will put students that apply after that that are admissible, they'll put them on a wait list and the student has to wait and, and, and find out later whether they got off the wait list or not. Um, there's no guarantees of getting off a wait list. And finally, with the selectivity, if they are um, highly selective, these that means there's a minimum, a limited number of seats available. We're talking about the Ivy League schools and beyond. There's other schools as well, but Ivy League is a great example of that. They have a very low rate of acceptance. So the Ivy League schools, all of them are under 10%. Probably most of them are actually under 8% of students actually get in. So it's a very low acceptance rate. Um, all required documentation plays a role in the decision process for these schools. It is that selective. They're looking at everything. If there's something missing, that could knock the student out of the competition. If they're not, um, you know, if they haven't followed direction. I mean, there's so many little things that could knock them out. And students that are really perfect students in your eyes, like they have top grades, top activities, they are, they can be declined admission at highly selective schools because most everybody that most everybody that's applying to this school have those qualifications. Um, that's just the way it works. Um, there's lots of qualified applicants and they can only take so many. So that's why you get into this situation of, of having a dream school, have some other schools that the students has applied to as well, that would also be very acceptable. So scholarship applications, some institutions make scholarship decisions at the point of admission, like we at the point of admission, we, we decide on the International Student Scholarship at that time, which our International Student Scholarship goes up to $30,000, with the average award being 25. So we make that decision right at the point of admission. But then we also have scholarships, like I point out in the second um, kind of sentence there, that make require a separate application, like our full tuition scholarship. That has a deadline. It has other requirements. And students don't find out till March about that one. So... Um, there are different uh, different ways different schools do it, but watch for deadlines. Typically, these are also not flexible. So typically, U.S. schools have deadlines. They usually stick with them. So what's next for the admitted student? Let's take that back one step and say, what's next for the not admitted student? So the non-admitted student, I would say, go to that list. Go to the um, the, the list of students or where the students has applied. If they don't get into their top choice, Certainly, we're waiting to find out what school they do get into, and hopefully they are getting into to one of their choice schools or one of their backup schools. Regardless, they're, they've made, hopefully they've done their research and these are schools that no matter which one they get into, it would be a good choice for them. So if they have multiple options, think about the best fit academically and socially. Where would this student do the best? And evaluate the offers, evaluate the scholarship, not just the scholarship amount, but what is the bottom line cost? Because a student could get a bigger scholarship, but if the overall cost at that school is much higher than their bottom line cost, what they actually have to pay 
could be higher than other schools, even if they have a bigger scholarship. So it's important not only to look at the, the amount of the scholarship, but what the remaining cost would be on an annual basis. And also considering, does this school, what's the average increase every year? So does tuition go up? Room and board will almost inevitably go up. You know, what are these increases per year? At Hope College, we have one advantage. We do what we call anchor tuition. So once you enter on one price for your tuition, that level stays the same the whole four years. So your tuition does not go up. Room and board goes up, but that's a very small amount of money compared to tuition. So look for those opportunities where a school's tuition maybe freezes or stays the same while you're there, because that's a definite advantage for, for you in, in budgeting and planning out the four years or, or for your parents that you're working with. Submit the commitment deadline deposit by a deadline that might be offered by the university, or if they're not offering a deadline, then you, the students want to submit it by May 1. That's the typical date to send um, uh, to send the deposit in no later than May 1. And then following that, the students should be watching for emails regarding housing, class registration, orientation, arrival, and then obviously they're scheduling their visa appointment. And hopefully I'm doing that well in advance because they really need to arrive by a certain date in the U.S., a lot of schools will not let you arrive late. Like you have to arrive for orientation um, by orientation date. We give it, I'd hope we give a two day window to arrive, um, but students know this way ahead of time. So there should be no reason why they can't arrive in that two day window before orientation starts. So a few resources that you could take a screenshot of, or you could look at this recording later. Obviously some hints, use the institutional websites, use the school's website because it has a wealth of information. Explore the institutional YouTube channels. There's a ton of videos out there that will give the student and the families an opportunity to really get a view of campus. There's virtual tours. Um, there's, there's tours of residence halls. There's all kinds of stuff. If the student is an athlete, they really need to use the NCAA website. That's the sports website. That's where a student has to be kind of cleared to be able to play athletics at the varsity level. This is really for like ultra you know, um, talented athletes. They have to be very, very talented to even have a chance of making uh, a U.S. team. But it's one that the student could look at to find, you know, what schools offer, you know, uh, varsity table tennis, what schools offer varsity lacrosse, whatever. The, uh, that website will give you the schools that have varsity teams in that. Education USA is a U.S. State Department, Department of State uh, organization. Um, they do have uh, web uh, locations uh, all around the world for over 400 locations. They give unbiased um, uh, information on studying the USA. And then the final one, final one is for U.S. citizens only, and that's where they would file the FAFSA form to potentially qualify for need-based aid. It's this year; it'll become available in December for the next year. Um, so again, U.S. citizens only. International students are not eligible to file the FAFSA. So time for interaction. I want to get your questions. That's a lot of information to present in 50 minutes, 48 minutes to be exact. Um, but um, uh, hopefully it was helpful. But I do want to make sure that I address your questions as well. So in the chat room, I've got a few there. I want to go back. Um, so uh, Jyoti said, is the early decision always conditional and unconditional? Um, so early decision is binding and they're gonna make the decision on the information they have. So students are applying typically, typically during their grade 12 year. So we won't have grade 12 final results at that point. Um, it's up to the school whether they say, I would say that the highly selective schools, it will be somewhat conditional. Like if the student doesn't do well in grade 12 or doesn't graduate, yes, they could rescind that offer. Um, and they won't know that till the summer, so it could be a last minute thing. But I would say, generally speaking, they're making the decision on how they feel the student is doing at that point and maybe projected grades. Um, so um, it depends on the school. I hate to say, but most of the answers I would give you to questions, a lot of the times it depends because there's so many schools that do things differently. But generally speaking, I would say it's conditional to the degree that the student needs to, to kind of maintain that comparable performance during, during grade 12. Um, so I hope that helps. Answer is SAT. Again, um, as I explained earlier, the SAT, it depends on the school. Many of us are test optional. So um, there isn't always uh, an SAT requirement. So it just kind of depends on the school. Um, but most of us, it's test optional. Um, Christine asked about a copy of the slides. I think this will, this will be recorded through Shimon Lee and you should be able to access 
um, that. Certainly any questions can be sent to me as well at crawley.edu, crawley at hope.edu, C-R-A-W-L-E-Y at hope.edu. But I think Shimon Lee will have this recording uh, and access to this. So what types of, uh, Christine also asked, what types of extracurricular activities would you advise students to be engaged in and when are they, when they're targeting highly selective? Um, I would say anything that they're going to be, that's going to be a long-term uh, investment in their time, like Model UN, anything where they can get leadership. Um, I mean, athletics is fine, but not if they're just a casual player. I mean, they can list that, but it's when they, anything that they're able to do, volunteer work, leadership, volunteer work could be in or out of school. Um, maybe their faith is important to them, so maybe they're involved in their church, um, other types of um, nonprofit organizations. Um, it's not a point, I don't think it's the quantity, but the quality that schools are looking for, because students can list 30 or 40 organizations, but we know they have not been thoroughly involved in 30 or 40 organizations. There are probably some that are really important to them. So I think listing the top 10, 15, or if it's less than that, that's fine, but listing the top ones that they've been involved in for a long time, that they've had a leadership role or an involvement, a heavy involvement in, um, I don't think there's a magic answer uh, because we have students who've done, you know, some students have done research, some students have done, um, again, the leadership that they've had, leadership in their class or leadership in their organizations. All of those kind of notable things will be will be noticed um, as opposed to just listing. I'm in these 15 clubs. Well, that, you know, that doesn't tell us much, but what have you done in those activities that make you stand out, make you maybe better than the next person or look more qualified or look more involved? Um, for school to, uh, if I have, and I probably said that wrong, sorry, is um, my school children appear for school B and Olympia, is there a special organization with the above? Um, I don't think there's any special organization, but certainly listing the involvement, um, uh, especially the Olympiads, uh, depending on if you're talking about math Olympiads or more the sport Olympiad type thing at the high school level. Well, I'm not sure, what the, but it's probably academic related that you're referring to. But yeah, especially if they've received awards, um, the spelling bee is not as um, influential, I wouldn't say. Maybe a, maybe if the student won it once, you could put, you know, especially if it was a, the junior, uh, the, the 11th grade or 10th grade, maybe listing that. But I don't know that that's going to be the most influential um, thing. But really anything depends on the student. What have they been involved in? What have they gotten awards for or leadership for? I think, yeah, those are the things that we want to see. Um, so somebody said, what is your experience? Um what in your experience is the list of the wow factor to enhance the chances of application being expected? I think what you're saying, GOT, is like, is there something maybe in the application that has been very impressive um, or what has like impressed me with an application? Um, I've worked at both public and private, and I've kind of seen a little bit of everything. Um, I don't necessarily get the same type of, you know, consistent, like all the applications we get that high level, like a Harvard or Yale would get, but I certainly get students like that. Just, I get a full range of students. But what I like to see, um, I like to see things that stand out, like, okay, a student is in Model UN and they were leader of the delegation or they got an award in Model UN for what they, how they presented or in, in, with their team. Um, if they're in robotics, that they were the captain of their robotics team and the team won this event. Um, or if they're active in their church and they teach, um, uh, maybe they teach Sunday school, but they've been doing it for a number of years and, and how this uh, kind of influences their choice. For me, that that is influential. It's not a major reason for admission, but it's influential because Hope College is a Christian college. You don't have to be Christian to go to Hope College. But um, you can be any faith or have no faith. That, 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 that's not part of the admissions uh, process. But the fact that the student has been involved in other things uh, can be influential to me that they, they've um, you know, taken some leadership roles. I would say the students also that have done research, not every student can get research, but the students that can, certainly the research or publishing a paper or something, that's that's kind of a wow factor if they've been able to do that. But again, I totally realize that some students don't have access to that. So I don't count it against a student if they can't do that. It's just when you're dealing with the most selective schools, a lot of the students have done this stuff. So they're competing against students who, who were able to do it. If they started their own company, if they were able to do coding and you know um, something with computers that you know is pretty influential. So I think there's 
certain activities that stand out that's just not your normal stuff um, that allow students to stand out. Students can also stand out with their essay, with their essay topic, and really being themselves and, and really get, bringing out some information in the essay that makes me feel like I know the student. And not only that, but that I feel the student's passion for what they're doing. And I feel the student's passion for really wanting to go to my school um, because it's about the match. It's not about just putting students in seats. It's about finding what students are the right right students for those seats. Um, Christine says, what students are majors? Uh, majors are popular with international students. It really does vary by country, um, I would say, or even sometimes even by city within a country. But generally speaking, I would say the STEM fields, which Hope College is very strong in, um, are very, very, very popular. So the biologies and chemistries, neuroscience, engineering are very popular, as well as business. Um, it's very popular. Um, within that, international business is popular. Also, I, I think another one, psychology, that does fall under STEM, but psychology, depending on what they're going to do with it, can be very popular. Um, and finally, uh, the business areas um, are very, very popular as well. Business, general business, um, and then even getting into the uh, the international side. Oh, I'm sorry, I mentioned that. International relations was the other one I wanted to mention. International relations. So global, we call it global studies. Other schools call it international relations. That's also um, very popular. Um, but it does vary. I think students have to think about what am I going to do with this degree when I'm done? Is it applicable in my home country? Some, some students have things like they want to be a teacher, and that's great. But will the teaching degree in Michigan, how will that translate when you go back home? So I think that's part of, part of it, too. Um, other things we really push students to do is experiential learning, like get some research internships, um, practical experience to build your resume while you're in college. Because one, the one common thing, everybody's taking the classes, in, they're taking classes, getting grades, everybody does that. So what else can you do to make yourself look better and different when you're going to get into graduate school or the job force? And that's the, the, the experiential learning. Like at Hope, 94% of our students do experiential learning. So they're doing research internships or study abroad, and we're ranked number 21 in the nation for undergraduate research. So it's those types of experiences that colleges in the U.S. want to give their students so they can be successful later. Um, so Christine also asked about interviews. It's a, it's a more limited number of schools, probably the most selective that actually do the interviews, um, although we do like for our full tuition scholarship. So um, I would say that's a different scenario. Like if they don't give you any prep for it, if they don't give you any questions ahead of time, then you need to pre come prepared to answer anything, um, really about your experiences, about your education, about your volunteer leadership. It could be a totally abstract question too. Um, and that's the same thing for, for you know the essays too. The essay, you kind of get the question ahead of time, but the interviews, you don't always get the question. So it's hard to say what type of questions will come up because every school is gonna approach it differently. Like for us, in the, you know, we have an essay for the full tuition scholarship and it says, they may, we may change it for next year, but the, the previous question was, think of a situation of hopelessness and how do you bring hope to that situation? Playing off the name of hope, but, but also being a very serious and very deep question, like how do you solve the world's problems type thing, you know, or a world problem or even a local problem, it doesn't have to be a world problem. But then for, for those that move on to the interview stage of our, the Hope Forward competition, we give them three questions, two or three questions ahead of time. Then we have another group of questions that they don't know about. So, and I don't even know what they are. Um, so, so in that way, the student really has to be prepared to really think on their feet, but also they've had a chance to prepare some questions too, or prepare for some questions to answer. So I wish I could give you an exact answer on that, Christine, but they really all, it depends on the school. It depends on the specific scholarship or admission. Um, they're, if it's for admission, they're looking for the right master, they're looking for the students to be the most successful. And if it's a scholarship, again, they're looking for success, but they're also looking for a good match for that program. I hope that helps. Uh, Mega, uh, Megna, um, I don't know of specific external websites for scholars. There are, there are some out there. The only thing I would say on that is don't pay for external searches because all this, the external searches that are charging you money, all they're doing is going out on the web and searching for possible scholarships. They cannot guarantee scholarships to any student, no matter what they say, they can't guarantee it because the student still has to apply for those scholarships. 
and get selected. All they will guarantee is that they will give you some websites to apply to or give the student websites. That's all they're guaranteeing is that they will find stuff that you could find yourself on the web, on the, on the, on the internet. But again, if students don't have time, families don't have time to do it and want to pay them to do it, that's their choice. But that's all they're doing is, is finding external scholarship the student might be able to apply to. But any external scholarship is going to have hundreds, if not thousands of applicants. Um, so I don't have a source for you. They're out there, but they are very challenging to get as well. Um, uh, GOT said, is it possible to show the colleges which accept students who excelled in sports? So there's no um, uh, possible to show the college was accepted. Um, there's no real list for that. I mean, you can go to the NCAA website and see which which schools have NCAA um, sports. It's important to understand that there's three levels of NCAA, Division I, Division II, Division III. Division I are the schools you see on television. It is extremely difficult to make those teams. You're competing with students from all over the world to get one of five spots that might be open on a basketball team in any given year. Um in division two are medium-sized schools. They can one and two can offer scholarship, but again, very limited number of scholarships they can offer. Um, like I'll use the basketball uh, again. They may have five full scholarships to offer in any one year. They might divide those in half, and then they have ten half scholarships. There's very few students coming to U.S. institutions that are getting a full athletic scholarship. No matter what they tell you, there's very few students who are getting full scholarships. Most of them are getting partial scholarships. Um, Division three schools like Hope College, we have extremely competitive athletic programs and, and, and facilities, but Division three schools cannot offer athletic scholarships. We still have national tournaments. We still have everything the other, stu the other divisions have, but we just can't. We're small private schools. We don't offer scholarship for athletics, but we have excellent programs and excellent facilities, um, extremely competitive. Um, Siraj, uh, business school master's program comes from tough to get. Um, Okay. All I can tell you about masters, I've been at schools that offer masters, and it's important to get your experiences at the undergraduate level, whether you're doing it in your home country or you're doing it in the U.S., you need as much experience as possible, um, not just your degree, to be considered for funding at the graduate level, which would be a graduate assistantship or a research assistantship. They want to see that you, that they're going to say, what have you done at the undergraduate level for us to award you this assistantship? So students have done research, they've done, uh, they've done internships, they've done practical experience. So they're bringing something to the table. Um, they're bringing something to offer that graduate program, that MBA program that will make them, uh, very often with MBA, it's going to be a teaching assistantship, not a research could be either one, but teaching would be more. So anything the student has done to really be able to express their knowledge, very strong English, um, the ability to teach entry-level classes um, would be something that a, a graduate assistant would need to do. So it's that practical experience, I think, that's going to make the difference. And the, the grade point average, too. Um, they want a really solid grade point average, but they want experience. You're right, Dominic, most schools don't give you the reason for denying uh, students. It's all about the selectivity of the school. If the student, if the school is very selective, it's really about that they only have so many spots and they have to make tough decisions. So um, it's important for students to know, especially if it's a very selective school and students very good, they just need to know that there are other students, and though this isn't what they want to hear, but there's other students just like them that have also been denied because the student, when you have a school that only has a 10% acceptance rate, that means nine, obviously, quick math here, 90% are not getting into the school. And almost all those students are very top students. So the, the universities have a, a really a decision to make about which ones. And sometimes geography comes into play. They might have within their goals that they want the, there to be a geographic distribution of their of their admission, of who, the admissions offers. So they may only allot so many spots to certain regions because they want to keep it diverse. I don't know. It's up to the school as to how they do that and what decisions they make. But um, there is sometimes there's not a good reason. Uh, because again, you're dealing with a top quality student in many cases. And so it's totally up to school as to what they're looking for. Um, and maybe even departmentally, like maybe there's only so many spots in that particular department of what the student wants to study. And maybe they're oversubscribed and they just can't take more students in the department because there's no seats in that department. So it can be very, very challenging. And I wish there was a good answer to give students other than it is very competitive. Um, and if, if, Financers are part of the picture. If the student doesn't have the finances to go, that could play into the decision for some schools. If they don't feel the student has the money to pay, they may not admit. 
Um, yeah. So thank you all for your time. Um, we, they have recorded the program. They'll get it out. They'll have it available. Please feel free to um, uh, let me know privately if you have any questions about Hope College or general questions. But Shimon Lee does a great job of of uh, presenting a lot of good information for all of you in the process of uh, doing your job. So we appreciate you. Thank you for being here. Thanks for all you do as students. And uh, yeah, there's the contact for Shimley. And thank you so much for being here. Thanks for your attention. Thank, thank you, audience. And thank you so much, Jim. Thanks for sharing such wonderful insights. I think you've been able to take us through so many requirements by listing them down as, as simple ways as checklist and that in such a short duration. Really appreciate the flow and the details that you've been able to put together for us. Uh, and I'm sure as educators, we now know what the next steps should we take back to our students. Uh, as a takeaway, I understand that there are various factors that would lead to a student to be a part of the dream college or university that they wish to be a part of. And it is their decision making skills that will definitely help. Uh, and as Jim spoke about certain uh, unfamiliar kind of situations that they can face, uh, they need critical thinking and uh, awareness skills. Let us as educators keep supporting them and guiding them by evolving and updating ourselves. And as an educator, I would also insist all of you to look out how Shimon Lee can serve as a support system for you. So reach out to the team Shimon Lee at any point that you feel that you need that kind of support. The contact details are on the right here on the screen. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for your time. Special thanks to you, Jim. Thank you. Have a good evening. Good evening to you. Thank you. Thank you, Chira. Thank you, Jim.